I welcome Dr. Monica Peek to introduce her session. And of course, we already know she's an Associate Professor of Medicine, a Buxbaum Senior Faculty Scholar, and Associate Director at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. Please welcome her. All right, so I'm delighted to be back uh, today with you all. Um, and the title of the talk now is Shared Decision Making Among Racial, Amongst Racial and Ethnic Minorities, which sounds a whole lot like what I talked about yesterday. So really, it's a continuing of a conversation that we had yesterday. So um, the first few slides are just going to sort of recap where we left off and then continue um, the, our conversation. So again, just acknowledging the various uh, centers where I sit at the University of Chicago, um, and then reminding us the three core domains of shared decision making, including information sharing, deliberation, uh, actual decision, uh, decision making and implementation. Um, and then how is social identity important to shared decision making? Um, and today we're going to lean a little more heavily into race and ethnicity, but that as just one of the many social identities um, that people carry that we talked a bit about more broadly yesterday. Um, and so this being sort of an incomplete list of uh, many of the social identities associated with social power that we all have. Um, including gender and gender identity. We had a very robust conversation about that and sexual orientation, about uh, ability and disability, uh, chronic pain, um, age, immigration status, many other social identities which impact our ability to navigate our world and impact our lived experience um, in society. So again, this rather busy uh, slide, which just uh, tries to show how shared decision making um, is <coughs> overlaid with these various social identities and how we see ourselves and how we see other people and how those relationships um, really influence our ability to share power in the clinical encounter, in the, in the clinical, clinical encounter and share in decision-making processes about the diagnostic evaluation and treatment evaluation, treatment plans between patients and patients being sort of a, a placeholder for patients and their families and their chosen families, so friends, family support networks, and providers, and providers being a placeholder for the entire healthcare team, those who are providing care, including a range of physicians, nurses, behavioral health workers, um, anyone who's involved in making those decisions. All right, so um, Marshall is on this paper, um, uh, a paper that we wrote about barriers and facilitators to shared decision making, specifically amongst African Americans with diabetes, which is the pa patient population that I study most. And what we found, we actually wrote this paper before the one uh, that had all the conceptual models, but what we found is that many of the barriers that patients reported in our qualitative interviews were ones that mapped out uh, years later uh, onto these conceptual models, uh, ones around power imbalance related to social identities, um, other things like limited health literacy, which can be a type of social identity uh, related to social identities, uh, self-efficacy, that's down here in the model, trust, it shows up several different places in the model, um, normative beliefs, and so those are some of the things that uh, are uh, reflected in the lenses through which people see and view uh, the encounters that, uh, that they're having with other people and view uh, the identities that people are, are uh, who, who they are and the identities that they have. A uh, sense of fear and denial about uh, the diseases that they carry, fear and denial um, about the kinds of healthcare experiences that they are anticipating having um, with providers. Um, and I think. There's usually one other thing that's on that list. But essentially that there are a number of things um, that uh, marginalized populations, in this case African Americans uh, with chronic disease, report as being barriers to sharing in the decision-making process. Um, and we also ask them about things that can facilitate the process. Um, and one of the things is the first S in the SHARE model um, from ARC, which we had also talked about yesterday. So um, patient engagement and invitation. So when physicians actually ask people, invite them into the SHARE process, um, that is something that helps people feel um, more welcome 
um, and more able uh, to engage. Um, the value and quality of the patient provider relationship. Um, when people feel like their health concerns are validated, it may be that their health concerns turns out are not important or are not a serious threat to their health. But at least having a health care provider listen to that concern um, and validate that I hear you. Like, huh, turn, you know, I, I've sat in here and, and listened to your, your concern about this, this symptom. As it turns out, it's just heartburn. It's really not heart disease. Um, it's acid reflux, and we can easily treat that. But it's completely understandable that you'd be worried that you're having a heart attack. And so uh, having a sense that people's <coughs> concerns are validated and not dismissed um, is particularly important, I think, for patients whose um, voices are routinely dismissed, whose voices are not heard in society. Um, and so having their voices heard in a clinical encounter, even if ultimately their health beliefs aren't accurate, is important to having a safe space in that patient-provider relationship and facilitating the idea of a shared uh, strategy for um, engaging with their providers. And then having providers be accessible and available. And by this, I don't mean office hours, um, but being emotionally and intellectually present um, during the clinical encounter. So those are good things. All these things are free um, and don't require changes in healthcare processes and extra money. Um, it really just requires how we are interacting with patients um, to help the process along um, to improve ultimately health outcomes. We also um, we're interested, I'm going to run through two papers quickly and then talk a little about, about some of the work that we do to intervene. Um, we asked the same population how they define shared decision making. So we have a good understanding of how, in theory, um, lots of people have approached the idea of shared decision making. Again, these three sort of core domains around information sharing, deliberation, implementation of the plan. Um, and when we talked to African Americans with diabetes, what we found is that it looked more like this. Um, and so there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I'm afraid to use the pointer. Um, but the two things that I want to point out, um, when we asked people to describe what a shared decision might look like to them based on their clinical experiences with their providers, um, is that many people reported having only a single medical option presented to them. They had no idea that for many conditions, or for any conditions, there could be more than one way to treat a problem. Never in their life had they been presented with more than one option. Like, you mean to tell me there's more than one way to treat diabetes? Or there's more than one way to, you know, treat strep throat? Um, and so their lived experience had been, you have this problem, here's a prescription, and this is what you do. You, you go to the pharmacy and fill this. They, they didn't know that they had, um, that the doctor in, in their own head was thinking about multiple options, but just giving them one. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that when people were in their own minds actively sharing in the process, one of the things they would do would be to potentially non-adhere to care. There was their behavioral way of enacting their decision. So if people could not verbally say no, they would behaviorally say no. And so in their minds, this was not um, a way of manifesting a lack of interest in their care. This was not a way for them to say that I'm uninterested in you know, managing my diabetes or getting treated for tuberculosis. This was their way of saying, I'm not comfortable with the plan of care. I don't understand the plan of care. Um, and so this is, I'm sharing in the treatment plan by not abiding by the treatment plan. And I may or may not be telling the doctor that I'm not going to be abiding by this treatment plan. And so when marginalized populations don't necessarily have a voice, in the encounter or perceive that they don't have a voice, um, people will find a way to have their expressed wishes 
manifest. And so we need to be aware of the complex ways in which those behaviors may present and um, be more flexible in our understanding of those behaviors um, when we see them back in the office and not just assume that people are not concerned about their health. I've never encountered anyone who's like, you know what, I'd really like to have my diabetic foot, you know, amputated or sign me up for a heart attack. Um, I, I've never heard that. Um, so, um, but we do see people all the time with poor health outcomes. Um, and I think that there are, people are always negotiating um, to the best of their abilities what makes the most logical sense for them at the time, given the information they have about their choices. So, so um, we also do uh, qualitative work, and so there's uh, a few quotes that I always love because I think they're fascinating, um, and so I'll share uh, two with you today. Um, and this is, these are two about the non-adherence. Um, one person said, the doctor told me I need to go to the dermatologist to get this skin growth, abnormal skin growth evaluated. Now the lady up there at the checkout desk, I told her that I didn't want to go. That if this skin growth goes down, then I don't see a reason to operate. So I'll have to think about that. And the interviewer says, well, did you tell the doctor you weren't going to go? Oh, well, I didn't tell my doctor about my preference for not messing with her. I just told her I would go through with it. So the doctor says, go, this looks horrible. Go, go see, get it taken out. She's like, sure, no problem. She gets to the checkout desk, don't make that appointment. <laughs> I've decided, doesn't look so bad. If it gets worse, I'll call you, and then I'll follow up. And then she goes home. So this is her way of managing um, the doctor's preference and her preference. Um, another person said, some African Americans still don't believe in everything the doctors say. I have a neighbor, and she goes to the doctor, and when she gets the medication, she throws it in the garbage can which is interesting um, because this is someone who feels sick, who calls for an appointment, waits two weeks to get into the doctor, sits in the waiting room for several hours, gets roomed, talks to the doctor, gets a prescription, goes to the pharmacy, pays for the medication, takes it home, and then says, this doctor's trying to kill me. <laughs> Throw that medicine away. So the, the complex um, thoughts and feelings that people have about the healthcare system and how to best treat their health. You know, should I go? Should I believe? Should I trust? You know, what to do? Um, how, how, you know, it, it's very confusing um, for people to try and figure out how to navigate the healthcare system. And when you have multiple competing feelings inside, um, it, it's really challenging. And so, um, so, these are just things to keep in mind as we are working with populations uh, that have a lot of uh, uh, competing beliefs about the healthcare system. This is another paper that Marshall is on with me. We did a series of papers about the impact of race and uh, shared decision making. Um, and just to sort of cut to the chase, um, we found that patients reported a number of factors at the patient level where race could negatively impact shared decision making in both the information sharing realm, in the deliberation realm, and in the decision making domain. So being uh, patients uh, might be, who are African American, uh, might be less likely to share information about symptoms and concerns. They might be less likely to speak up and question the authority of physicians. Um, people who are marginalized and oppressed frequently feel um, that way in all walks of life when it comes to um, <coughs> institutions of power and authority, to the police, to educational systems, and it's hard to, to switch when you're in the healthcare system and suddenly feel empowered. Um, patients may be less likely to adhere for, to treatment plans for a number of reasons, some of which I just discussed. Um, so uh, one person said there are very few African Americans that would question the treatment they get. And here's the one about the garbage can. For physician factors, patients said that there, um, again, a lot of potential negative impacts of race on the same three shared decision-making domains, um, such that African Americans may be, uh, have their physicians less likely to give information 
about explanations and test results, may be less likely to listen, really truly hear what their African American patients are saying, um, may be more domineering over African American patients and talk down to them, and may be less likely to consider patient preferences for treatment. Um, and there are actually a series of parallel studies that have done audio tapes and videotapes of clinical encounters between physicians and black patients and have shown all this to be true. Um, but what we know is that patients actually understand that and realize what's going on too. So the patients that we talk to, which are different patients from previous studies, are saying the very same things that have been borne out with other surveys and with uh, videotape studies as well. Um, and in one person in our qualitative interview said that, my mother always said that the doctors did not tell me the things that would happen to me. And I only wondered in my own mind whether that would have been a race thing. Maybe they assumed that she would not understand and we should just do this, do this, do this, do that, take this, take that, without a reason why. But my mother was an intelligent woman. So then last, uh, someone yesterday asked about, uh, can you stop being so abstract and give me, <laughs> and give me something to do. Uh, so, <laughs> so here's an example of some work that Marsh and I are doing in the city of Chicago, um, which is primarily uh, right around the, the University of Chicago, our working class African American community. Um, so we're trying to do a, a multi-level intervention uh, to address uh, the diabetes disparities in our community using a range of different things, um, some of which have to do with interventions that are culturally tailored to um, increased patient empowerment and shared decision making. So the, we call it the Southside Diabetes Project for short, but the full name is Improving Diabetes Care and Outcomes on the South Side of Chicago. Um, and we have worked our program around the chronic care model, which I showed yesterday, and the patient activation core is uh, just briefly what I'll talk about today, where we're trying to get patients to um, feel more empowered about their health. It's a 10-week program. We're actually, oh, today's, no. Is today Monday? No. Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Time has been suspended since I've been in India. Uh, so yesterday we just started a, another class um, last night. It was Tuesday. So it's Tuesday morning. It was, it's Monday night there. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a class going on at a church in Chicago um, that is kicking off our at, at another 10-week class. So there's culturally tailored diabetes education um, along with a curriculum specifically for shared decision making. Um, and instead of talking about these three domains, we talk about discuss, debate, and decide. So the three Ds of shared decision making when we're just uh, talking about them with our patients. So have a friendly discussion with your doctor about you know, everything that's important to you, have a friendly debate about the pros and cons of the treatment plan, and then make a decision uh, that's right for you. Um, and so we do a lot of things that fit the social cultural experience of African Americans um, with a lot of familial involvement, <coughs> storytelling, things that um, fit a strong faith-based um, orientation. Uh, currently these uh, classes are actually physically located in the church and draw a, a lot from the religious history. Um, modifying traditional diets, really leaning into the community resources, using a lot of adult learning theory around um, sort of very interactive classes. We have a lot of sort of fun games and video, uh, video that we've actually made for the class, which I usually show a clip of, but uh, I'm not doing that today because I usually have challenging <laughs> challenges with technology. Anyway, so when we uh, initially evaluated the program, and we're about to sort of do our big wrap up of all the data, but our pilot work showed that uh, we had improvements in some measures of uh, diabetes self-confidence, um, measures of uh, diabetes self-management, um, like checking their feet, exercising, following healthy eating, um, improvements in measures of shared decision making at both the patient and the physician level, um, and then more standard outcome measures uh, around um, diabetes control, some improvements in cholesterol, um, and most notably at the very bottom, which you probably, uh, on that slide over there, we saw um, significant improvements um, that lasted at six months uh, of self-reported mental health. And I will say that we did not specifically have a mental health module, but we found uh, in general through all of our programs that the idea of having a safe space with social support um, meant a lot to the overall health and well-being of our patients. Um, and that 
people enjoyed and appreciated um, the love that they received. And so people just uniformly felt better. And so our measures of social support um, and mental health have uh, sort of uniformly improved with all of the programs that we have that are part of the Southside Diabetes Project. Um, so in conclusion for that program, um, our early findings show that combining culturally tailored education with training and shared decision making can improve the self-management, shared decision making, sense of confidence, and diabetes related health outcomes. Um, and such strategies may serve to reduce diabetes disparities amongst African Americans and potentially other socially marginalized populations. Uh, this was um, an older picture of, of, of our team that was working on it. This is some of the funders for that work. And I'll just end with an, another acknowledgement of uh, the people who helped support me at the university. So I'm done. Thank you so much, Dr. Peek, especially for the perspective that non-compliance is not a disinterest in healthcare. It's a reclamation of power. And moving on, uh, the next two speakers that we have, Dr. Nalin Mehta and Dr. Mohit Joshi. So Dr. Nalin Mehta is an additional professor of physio physiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And he's also the chairperson of the Institutional Ethics Committee at UCMS uh, with an extreme interest in bioethics and a passion for it. He's also a very passionate educator. And Dr. Mohit Joshi uh, is, is assistant professor of surgery at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So please welcome these two incredible people. What we plan to do is uh, have a chat. You let us know when to shut up and when it's time. And feel free to jump in whenever you need to. You know. And uh, we want to hear your perspective for the simple reason that the topic that has been given to me, it's almost uh, religious inequalities when it comes to shared decision making. Not too much has been you know, uh, written about it or published. There are a couple of good articles. But even they tend to harp on racial and ethnic uh, inequalities rather than religious inequalities, which are there. But we will now slowly try and elicit or tease them out. So shared decision making, I presume yesterday it was already discussed ad nauseum, where it was realized that in our country, shared decision making is virtually not there. So we have these kind of examples every day when at the end of the day you speak to a patient that these things they look very nice when you talk about consent and you tell them that you are suffering from this disease these are the treatment plans so have these two treatment plans and then option a is like this option b is like this there's pros and cons of both and ultimately when you kind of you know invest this much time <clears throat> your empathy to the patient and ultimately you receive a reply see doctor do whatever you feel is good for me yeah, it's like the, the doctor-patient relationship is a very paternalistic model. We do not delve in the deliberative model or the consultation at all. Including our own colleagues, doctors, they'll come up and say, you know, do whatever you feel is that. That's being polite. But we'll flag the term empathy that is, you know, it's lacking almost. Uh... Now, when we come to religious inequalities, now these are a couple of things which will get overlapped with one, insensitivity, religious insensitivity, and also ignorance. There's one uh, good article by, uh, I think, uh, Padela, Asim Padela and Par Kerlin, which talks about racial and ethnic, and also mentions religious inequality. Now, how these, uh, you probably read that uh, article. Now, how these affect the healthcare, and this is in context with Islam, how these affect the health care of the patient. One is they talk about, by defining the health and healing within the medical sphere and the religious sphere, which we tend to overlook. I'll give you an example how. Second is by setting ethical and legal standards for acceptable and non-acceptable therapies. We have got examples for these as well, right? Very, very basic uh, example would be uh, using bovine or porcine you know, products because these are, some are acceptable, some are not acceptable. And then last and not the least, by exposing adherence to deleterious uh, effects of social practices when they 
for example, mutilating uh, circumcision for female uh, circumcision. Now, these are religious practices, but these do not become inequalities. So now we will bring out issues where there are inequalities. Now, as I understand it, inequality would be where I refuse to accept your faith or I refuse to do justice to you when it comes to healthcare delivery because you belong to a specific faith. Now, there are examples of these where uh, there have been instances where some doctors have been rather uh, callous in their approach to people from a specific faith. So if you have any examples or any uh, experiences, I would love to hear from you. Anybody? Where you felt religious, yes, Anand. Yeah, so, um, I, mean, I don't know how many of you remember, but uh, there were, uh, I mean, riots in Gujarat in 2002. And uh, the medical friend circle of which I am a member was among the few uh, groups which went in post the riots. And it was striking that hospitals were divided on religious lines. So there were Hindu hospitals, inverted commas, and Muslim hospitals. And patients feeling comfortable in going to a particular hospital and not feeling comfortable and not being made comfortable also. Now that was probably periodic in the sense this was the immediate aftermath of the riots, but uh, was quite striking that you know healthcare, which we think is more egalitarian, also suffers from the same social divides which plague when there is a, a you know strife of some kind. So I mean that's it has happened. So refusing to acknowledge that is probably failing the profession. No, we will be very honest in our confessions and in our acceptances here. That is a, a thing that stood out very clear. Yes, sir. in a medical college, my assistant professor, a Muslim, wrote the entrance test to Bombay, got into uh, a prestigious medical college in Bombay for DM gastroenterology. And this happened just after those uh, Bombay terror attack. And he, he actually, merit-wise, was the top, top student, but he was posted to the fourth unit in, in the department. And that was the department with the lowest load. And he was never given endoscopies to do. He was given the task of collecting x-rays, collecting lab so forms. Absolutely. And when he went to search for a place to stay in the other area, nobody gave him a house. Eventually, he got a house. He moved in with his wife and his daughter, with his uh, son. And they spray painted on his car saying, get out of Bombay, we don't need you here. He left the DM seat. I mean, he left the gastroenterology seat and went back to so very unfortunate. So here, beyond uh, inequality, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I do interact a lot with the Tibetan community in uh, the Haramshala, and I have writer friends there and friends who work there, run schools there. Uh, most of them are still getting their treatment uh, in the traditional Tibetan medicine way. Uh, in fact, even for some of the, you know, um, so to say, fatal ailments, uh, because they often complain that uh, there is discrimination in the government hospitals there and they are still treated as refugees. Tum to, tum dawai leke kya karoge? You know, I mean, you, you, giving medicine to you is useless. So the Tibetan community there, uh, because they are Buddhists and they believe that, they also believe in a lot of uh, alternative healing practices. That is one thing. But when they approach the government hospitals or medical co colleges there for health care, they are discriminated against. So I know some personal experiences. Thank you. I'll just come to you. So I'll just take off there. The Tibetans, they, in fact, they have their own hospital. Yeah. In fact, I was there for a week once uh, as a guest of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and went around those. They've got wonderful systems. Now, one point that comes out of what you just said, we do not respect the local yeah. or the traditional healing. Western medicine been around for maybe two, 200 odd years. So we call ours alternative, whereas this modern medicine is actually alternative. Now the problem is we have alienated it so much that when you decide that this is something which is going to help because of your religious beliefs, the doctors tend to absolutely disregard it. Yeah. That again is uh, you know being yeah. religious uh, insensitive and inequality. For example, in a whole bunch of religions, it. <laughs> in Islam as well as in uh, uh, Hinduism and in Buddhism, there are times when you're not well, you feel it's a curse, you've done something wrong, karma, etc., etc. You've heard all these terms? Yeah. 
So in addition to your treatment, you require that little meeting with the priest or maybe some small ritual, burning of a lamp or incense or you know flowers in front of a deity or some prayer which you believe will help and you very strongly believe it will help. And that is not permitted. The doctor comes in, Nare, ye pandit pandit hai, kya kar rahe Maulana ko bula liya, get out, take the priest out, take them all be out, or the, uh, you know, those kind of things happen. Where they are dirtying up the place. Yes, I had your hand raised. I wanted to extend that point because uh, I also write on uh, uh, medical profession and violence. And lately, whatever cases of violence has been covered, there's been a narrative that a specific community and I've talked to a lot of doctors who say that if you live in this ilaka of Mumbai or if you live in this ilaka of Delhi or Gujarat, a specific community comes up. And because that is also a larger reflection of the social distress which is right now in the society. So how do doctors in general have to address that? Because when a patient comes, and I, I know it's also an issue of people will, there are lots of people there and there's violence, but how do they tackle distress when it comes, when the patient comes to, how do they talk to them and pass, try to make them understand so that such situations don't arise? Because the, there's a deep mistrust which comes from the social distress. Mistrust, I'll take that as a key word there. And the distress, I mean the doctors, when you have a you know, a deluge of patients coming in, you're not even thinking. So giving time to the patient becomes very difficult. What? When you are in the trauma center, yes. Yes, how much time do you have? How are you? I don't, don't worry. You, you don't have time for that. But that is no excuse. There's a wonderful book. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, no, this is a bit of unease about the whole religious thing. I'll tell you what my unease is. Uh, while I fully appreciate that people's religious beliefs uh, need to be respected and people have a right to those religious beliefs, I think there's a danger of conflating. Uh, if, you know, conflating, whether you like it or not, call it modern science or Western biomedicine or Western science, and conflating that with religion. And I think there's a, a, there is an important reason why those things need to be kept separate. Uh, because religious methods and practices and beliefs uh, are at times very antithetical uh, to the notion of how Western biomedicine uh, has a belief system which is based on certain evidence and what evidence means and all of that. So my concern is not about respecting people's religious beliefs because that's a different notion versus saying we should adopt those religious beliefs as part of a scientific process. And I think these two things do need to be kept separate. But sir, is, is there a midway? Because you have to have a midway then. Religion and science are anti then we cannot, I will, we cannot separate you know what, this is interesting. the practice. I'll take up <laughs> that debate. We'll arm wrestle whatever <laughs> outside this. But he's brought out a very interesting point. One was the mistress that I flagged there and I'll carry it up. There's a fantastic book called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. And Fatima, this is a Hmong family from Laos who settled down in the US. And they have this little girl with the Gastaut syndrome, intractable epilepsy. And they have their own, you know, religious uh, uh, and cultural uh, prayers. And the family gets involved. And they are get, being treated in California. And they have their own thing. And the patient deteriorates because of the personal beliefs of the Hmong family. The support system is immense. They are a you know, small refugee family versus the beliefs of the doctors. Now, Antithesis would be too harsh. Now, how would it happen? If you are treating a patient, you've done a major surgery, and they say, we just want to light an incense and have the priest come and you know do some mantras, or the Malvi comes to bless them. How does it, there is, where is the conflict? But people are opposed to that. Now, it is insensitive or religious inequality, call it whatever you may. Now, the doctor, the onus, when it comes to ethics, the onus is on the physician. I need to be sensitive to your requirements. I need <coughs> to be ethical in my conduct. I have to be aware. The onus is on the physician. Now, when you talk of Islam, in fact, I want uh, to make one thing very clear. And I appreciate what Anand said when he spoke about that Hindu-Muslim riots. We tend to 
hide behind political correctness and not say Hindu Muslim. The more we talk about it, the more we will be accepting that we've screwed up, and then we can come closer and sort it out. So there is a solution. So the more you hide it, it still is, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, burning and comes out. Smoking, alcohol, narcotics, these are all haram when it comes to Islam. Now, it is acceptable in an anesthetic or a painkiller. So we make issues out of it. Inequalities occur when you do not give the patient. So the shared decision making, where you can inform the patient, OK, this is the product. Is this OK with you? All the patient might say, is, no, I do not accept it. So we look for an alternative. The alternative may be a little low on quality. Is that acceptable? You will probably have a little issue. If the patient says it is acceptable, patient preferences, you, Monica, where is Monica? You mentioned pre patient preferences. So when you do discuss and decide the patient preferences in the social and religious construct, we tend to say, Are, this is a cultural issue. When it is something which is religious and the patients are attached to it, we cannot you know, traumatize them by, we, I mean, uh, if you say it is uh, in anti, there is always a way where religion can be accommodated. You can't have 100 people coming in Dhol Baja in the hospital, all that is fine, but you can give them a little space. Meditation, Tibetan. Yeah. When they talk of meditation, why deny that? And there are a couple of books where there is evidence to say that, uh, I forget the name of the author. There started is the medical medium by Anthony Gilliam, which is and <coughs> another <coughs> where med it ha Evidence says that yeah. meditation, especially in cancer patients, has yes. gone a long way in improving longevity. Yeah. But we as doctors and scientists, empirical, we believe anything that cannot be counted or quantified or uh, this. I wouldn't have a problem with that. That's what I wouldn't have a problem There is evidence for that. I wouldn't have a problem with that. No, 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 no. I'm not saying you have a problem. No, what I'm saying, but, but I, think, I think the issue which is not, which I, and I think it would be wrong to reduce it down saying, so are we not being tolerant of it? I'm completely tolerant. Like, I think I don't know if Joe took it in Nokia, but I kind of, Joe was on a panel with me, and I said something about, you know, I mean, how we. How, how rational is something about cancer? Yeah. How, how yeah. rational is it to believe in God? But clearly you do, so I respect your belief. And then somebody who is not, I will not. No, 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 no. Is, I, am is not, I don't have to agree with her. I don't have to say, oh, Absolutely. Wow, this is part of science and I'm going to incorporate it into science. No, also, I'm not baiting you. I'm not baiting you. All I said was when you say this is, there is a way, middle path. Now, issue is, I said three, inequality, insensitivity, ignorance, lack of awareness, etc. They are all, you know, these circles that are overlapping. Now, whenever there is a bias, I'm going to treat this guy like this. Oh, he, he looks like this. I'm going to. That bias is where inequality occurs. There are some nations that have a bias against specific religion. I mean, uh, and if it's a policy, then there's very little you can do about it. So eventually, it comes down to patient preference. Yes, sir. Um, sort of build upon the point. I mean, there's going to be a, a, a large middle zone where it's all consistent in terms of um, equally good ways to get to the same end or people agree upon the treatment, but it's the style of communication and the overall framing of, of the issue. But then there are going to be some cases where there is that clash between science and religious belief. So in the U.S., two examples would be a vaccination where some religious groups um, uh, oppose vaccination. Uh, another example would be like um, this big case. Right. So, but then, like, that, that brings the question that is it because of religious inequality? Will it qualify for that? Or is it someone's personal belief? Or religious belief? So, where's the, where's the question of inequality there? So, one example is the vaccination, and then it's the public health issue. If there's um, uh, a significant number, there, there, are, there are enclaves, I think enclaves, where there's going to be a significant number of unvaccinated children who then pose a public health risk to the wider population. Another example that uh, has been in the news, uh, there are times where like, there will be like, a child that has a, a childhood cancer that would be responsive to chemotherapy, but the parent, because of religious beliefs, don't want to have a kid uh, treated. So, uh, so those are two cases where it seems starker and harder to argue in terms of like, well, it's a middle ground between the right. So now let me make this simpler. Let's take the religion out of that context. <laughs> it's just there's a medication, the parents refuse treatment. The patient is going to die. 
child. And you know, we become a lot more emotional when it's a child. So when we talk of a child, uh, the parents refusing treatment for whatever reason, and then for religion. So if we take the religion out of it, it still is as bad. So my question is, if I can agree with him and his preferences, and he is happier with the overall treatment, even if the treatment is maybe not 100%, maybe 80, but he's happier, where's the problem? He requires the treatment. It always doesn't have to be my way or the highway. So you cannot always entertain, but then you can always mediate, you can always discuss and ask for a little discount on that, you know, severe religious uh, restriction where the patient might suffer. So explain. I think discussion and deliberation, when you explain the entire thing, for example, a narcotic being given to a Muslim, he may be absolutely against. So you can tell, you know, these are exceptions in this situation. This is the only, you know, uh, option we have. If it is acceptable, he or she says no. We talk to the family. <coughs> At the end of the day, they might compromise because, again, when you are not well or when you are traveling, some of these things don't apply. <laughs> you can always this. So there are ways of going about it. The overall or the overarching need of the hour is to ensure, you use the word tolerance. <coughs> Wonderful. We need to be tolerant. What Anant mentioned, the issue there was far, I mean, there's a lot of history to it. It's not just... Uh, unfortunately, we don't talk of religious inequality. We talk of a little bit of a bias at times. We, uh, there was the other uh, issue of this one doctor who had performed uh, female sterilization on all the patients from a specific religion without telling them. And this was some 1400 odd cases. It was a big news. It was, you know, that is criminal. And these instances have, there have been instances of similar actions abroad as well. Some of them mean, you know, take cultural or they say it is ethnic or racial. With, with disability also, it is common. Uh, many women with disabilities are being uh, uh, advised on, for, on sterilization and even the, the homes, even the families agree to it and... So Pressure. No, very well brought up. A wonderful point. In fact, there was this huge issue in Australia with, our, with the aboriginals, especially the aboriginal women in jails, yeah. that they have to be sterilized forcefully yeah. and everybody agrees to it. One very interesting thing closer to home. It happens all the Surgeons, please raise your hands. <laughs> I don't know how many times. Daksa, I will not be operated on a Tuesday. I need to be operated after 11.14 a.m. Are we delivering the have not yet come. I was just going to ask the gynecologist. You realize that? I want to be operated at an auspicious time. I do not want to be operated on such and such a day. And here he is. Okay. I mean, that's your... So, how hard is it? Deliveries. An incredibly pregnant woman. Uh, sorry, you know. <laughs> what I meant was about to deliver. Full term. I want to deliver by section at 923. 34 seconds. 34 seconds. <laughs> now that muhurt is, is an auspicious. Yeah, yeah. Muhurt is a word for auspicious. So these are things that happen. Some of them sound funny. At times, the hospital uh, uh, may be stretched with resources to try and entertain such things. But now, these are things. So, yes. Is that, is that a religious thing? Or yes. Is that the now you could club it, but religious, I want this child to be born at this time. This would be the nakshakram, this will be the... You see, why I raised the question of consumerism is that because if you believe in the notion of consumerism, uh, then as providers we should actually entertain it and do it. If you are opposed to the idea of consumerism, then you will as clinicians oppose it. Not because you oppose the religious logic, but you are opposing the consumerism of it. Wonderful. I like that thought. But it's yes, too complicated. that thought. No, 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 no. You know, there are times uh, when you want to play the devil's advocate. <laughs> you negated saying consumerism, it will always be touted as religious intolerance. Mm -hmm. I 
the no, I want you to come up with this because see, unless we have somebody stirring the pot, this discussion is going nowhere. But there is that perspective and I respect that perspective. In the government hospitals, people will say, sorry, I don't have time for this. I'm not going to wait just because you want to deliver at 11. But if you want this, please go to a private hospital. They'll do as per you. So there are... Yes, that so, so that point, exactly. So that point is taken because the government hospital which is providing free service to everybody is not going to cater to whims and fancies. And they'll tell you, we respect your uh, wish, but here it would be impossible. This train doesn't leave now. <laughs> you catch one from which station where it uh, meets your time. So, is there something we've missed on religious inequalities? Yes. I'll just come back to you. Uh, one of the very basic things in uh, shared decision making is to give information and to offer choices. And this um, uh, has been, uh, you know, my personal experience when it comes to contraception that if someone comes with the name of, let's say, Salma, so we'll assume that since her name is Muslim, so she's a practicing Muslim. And uh, not all people who are born to Muslim parents are practicing Muslims and believe in everything what is the general belief. And also, Islam is not one set of beliefs. I mean, uh, there are many sects and many things. And uh, sometimes people believe, but then their actions may still be different because we all are negotiating all the time, right? So because of this, and this happens, uh, let's not only blame doctors, this happens with a lot of ANMs in subcenters and PHCs that they do not offer certain types of contraceptives to all people with Muslim names. And it's like they never were told about it and never a choice was offered about it. And uh, to assume that all Muslims do not practice uh, birth control methods or contraceptives of any choice would be very wrong. So many times these assumptions are made. Absolutely. It's, it's like assuming that all Jains uh, avoid onions and garlic, which is not true. <laughs> I think that's a very well said. Salma example was awesome. I have a friend, I'm not going to take names here, but there's a friend of mine while we were doing our uh, masters in uh, Toronto. We went out to a pub in the evening and here he is with a, you know, so we say, what do you have, uh, Coke or, he said, why can't I have a drink? Are you supposed to have a drink? So we tend to take it for granted and that kind of patronizing is also something which is not appreciated. So why I'm bashing the doctors here is because we are talking about religious inequalities from the healthcare provider point of view. Patients have their own demands. They can be insensitive, but right now the onus is on us to provide and to provide with the equanimity and equality. Equanimity is also something that gets disrupted the drop of hat, and we need to be tolerant. Mohit, you have anything to add? I have saved you some time. Or? <laughs> you were supposed to tap my wrist. But I don't know how but many of you, but please we'll give her a big hand because I haven't heard a voice as golden as that. Really? Really? So I hope that uh, we kind of we touched on to that topic. It was a difficult one to you know figure out and to come up with. And uh, before we had the session, I had a long discussion, Dr. Nalin, because we had so many instances of the religious thing coming up in in the practice, but I was kind of confused that whether it is really inequality or is it somebody's like, you know, uh, believing in or not believing in someone's personal belief. So that probably that thing is quite of, uh, it's like kind of uh, cleared now. And I must appreciate the kind of examples you, you brought in because that made the whole thing a little more clearer, at least to me. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, sirs. Uh, I'm sure in the question answer session to follow, the room will erupt several more times. Uh, but moving on to the next talk. Dr. Charles Ree, Assistant Professor of Medicine in Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine, is also the Director of Hospice and Palliative Medicine Fellowship and Cardiac Palliative Care Program at the University of Chicago. Uh, welcome, sir. So first of all, I want to give a major welcome to, uh, Thanks to, hold on, to um, the University of Chicago at Delhi for inviting me um, to speak in front of such an illustrious group of participants. Um, this is the first time speaking here. I actually had the opportunity to visit India 18 years ago as a backpacker, you know, kind of <laughs> trekking through India, and that was quite an adventure. Um, so this is a very different circumstances. There we go. 
Um, and this is going to be a little bit of a challenge, uh, distilling what is essentially about three or four separate hour-long talks into 20 minutes. But you know, think of it, uh, I think of it as a tasting menu of uh, kind of topics that um, I was given. So one, the astute observer will notice there's already a slight change in my title. So the title in your program says Shared Decision Making in End of Life. Now, thanks to the esteemed Dr. Raj Gopal's talk yesterday, we have kind of started the talk about redefining palliative care. So I have deliberately changed the uh, title subtly. And we, and we will talk, hopefully, a bit about end of life care, shared decision making. But you know, I think to start with is the first thing is kind of well to better characterize the state of palliative care both today as well as in America. And I often start, when I give an introduction to palliative care talk, I start with this slide, just some very common misconceptions. Palliative care is the same thing as hospice, or palliative care is only for dying people. Um, now, this mode of thinking, to be fair, you know, it's important to look at where it came from. And to be honest, it wasn't that long ago that those notions were actually fairly accurate. So I don't really begrudge you know, doctors who trained you know, some time ago for still having these, uh, these notions. You know, I make my best efforts to educate them about how it has changed. But it is very important to realize that um, the field of palliative care, um, as was described by Dr. Raj Kapal, you know, this supportive uh, care model involving not just the physical, but psychological, spiritual, cultural aspects of a person, a patient's, you know, person, did arrive from the modern day hospice movement, which is often credited with uh, the invention of by Dame Cecily Saunders in England in, in the 50s. Um, and she herself coined the term total pain, uh, talking about the distress felt by people in uh, terminal, at the end of life. So, you know, you can really actually interchange these two uh, labels. You know, they, they were kind of essentially synonymous. So what changed? Dr. Raj Kapal um, referenced this article, but I want to talk about it a little bit more because it is rare that you can really put a firm date, like an exact time when a field came into its own. But at least in the United Palliative Care in the United States, this article was seminal. Jennifer Temmel, who's the lead author, is an oncologist at Massachusetts, uh, Mass General, uh, one of the Harvard hospitals. And in 2010, she uh, authored this paper, Early Palliative Care for Patients with Metastatic Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. Now, the fact that this study was even allowed to happen was revolutionary. Before this point, it, 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 especially in the oncology world, palliative care, that was a dirty word. It was, you know, it meant the oncologist had failed. It meant, you know, keep those people away from my patient. They're going to kill my patient. They're going to convince them not to do chemotherapy. I, I don't want them anywhere near my patient. So the fact that the study even occurred is nothing short of a miracle. Um, so to really briefly summarize some of the findings, it was represented such a major paradigm shift in the field. So by modern standards, with what we know today about healthcare, it seems like a no-brainer. Two separate uh, uh, cohorts, both newly diagnosed metastatic non-small lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. So you know, this was before the age of immunotherapy. Um, so prognosis was pretty much six months on average, I mean, give or take, of course. So these were you know, what we would call terminally ill patients. However, these were patients who, even knowing this, at time of diagnosis, they still wanted maximal treatment with the extent of extending their life for whatever period of time they could get. And remember, as I said, this was before immunotherapy. The treatments were these very toxic systemic chemotherapies that were very harsh on the, the body. So the two two arms of the study, one receiving standard oncological care, and the other receiving standard oncological care plus a palliative care physician kind of uh, helping with symptom management and uh, overall support. So I mean, as I said, it's a no-brainer by modern day standards. So they, the study was designed to look at quality of life metrics, which obviously the palliative care arm did much better, you know, anxiety and depression scores, uh, symptom burden, 
I mean, one would hope that you know, having a physician who is kind of attuned to these things would improve those metrics. And that finding has been replicated over and over again in subsequent studies. Now, the, the bombshell finding that really made people uh, stand up and pay attention, as was uh, referenced by Dr. Rajkumar, was that the palliative care arm showed a statistically significant, at the time, I, I'll clarify that in a bit, um, increase in median survival by almost three months. Um, now, this finding was very puzzling. And the problem is this study was not designed with mortality as a primary endpoint. So the problem is subsequent um, you know, kind of review of the data, really, I mean, no one could really figure out why. I mean, there's many hypotheses. You know, one is uh, you know, patients who want to pursue aggressive chemotherapy in this state, you know, main, the main reason people drop out of treatment is side effect profile. So perhaps if you had someone more attuned to managing the side effect, they could actually be treated longer. Um, Dr. Temel, when she talks about this paper, she will often say, uh, you know, very frankly, we oncologists kill people with chemotherapy. Um, so perhaps, you know, having a physician help um, guide some conversations about whether this is really um, appropriate for the patient. Um, so, but the, the interesting thing is the more we call through this data, the more, you know, to be honest, we kind of question how statistically significant this was, or especially how clinically significant this was. I mean, to be fair, in the oncology world, even if you have a, a new drug that has a one-month survival improvement, all of a sudden the headlines are like, cancer breakthrough, and, you know, they don't quite clarify that it means you get one month more. It's still a breakthrough in the cancer world. So regardless, it was the finding that made um, oncologists kind of sit up and pay attention. And just at breakneck speed from that point on, um, palliative care became integrated within oncology practices to the extent that it is practically standard of care in every major oncology center um, in the United States. Um, so, you know, with that finding, um, palliative care starts growing and expanding into kind of non hospice um, domains. And this is a very common figure that I use in most of my talks. So the top figure is kind of the old school model of hospice and palliative care, where you, know, you have diagnosis at the, at the left-hand side, uh, you know, maximal life prolonging, hopefully curative treatment until you don't. And at that point, you know, the uh, primary physician, subspecialist throws up their hands and says, I have nothing more for you. You need to go into hospice. And that's where palliative care took over. So that was the old model. The bottom figure is kind of the more modern uh, conception of where palliative care is. So as you can see, you know, one of our favorite catchphrases that Dr. Raj Kapal references, palliation begins at diagnosis. So ideally, and I, I use the word I emphasize the word because you know, this is an ideal situation. Um, you know, palliative care, which is represented by the black uh, box, you know, is introduced at the beginning of a uh, diagnosis of a life-limiting uh, life illness. And you know, the role of palliative care at that point is very minimal. It might be just rapport building, getting to know the patient. It, it might be very... It, very well may not be more than that, but and the maximal uh, effort is still towards kind of like belonging, potential curative treatment. But as the disease progresses, whether it's cancer or heart failure, COPD, renal disease, the efficacy of those treatments starts diminishing. And very often, symptom burden starts increasing at the same time. And so you start seeing a kind of shift in the um, role of, of both sets of providers until finally a similar, you know, there is a point where there are no more treatments available and that, you know, hospice becomes very appropriate for the patient and then palliative care assists with that transition into hospice. Um, <laughs> Dr. Rajkumar kind of, uh, I, I was questioning whether I would keep this slide because you, you kind of referenced that it. it's a little outdated. Um, it, it is 17 years old, but this is the WHO definition of health care. And I just highlighted what I think are, you know, kind, kind of the well-known but very important facets of health care. You know, so life-threatening illness, it is ideally, you know, we talk about palliation beginning at diagnosis for many disorders. 
Um, one of the issues in the United States is the workforce shortage in uh, palliative care physicians. So there are education efforts kind of teaching palliative care skills to all physicians so that you know, it doesn't have to be limited to this uh, patient population, but it is still a work in progress. Uh, but the important things are, you know, it is um, relief from pain and other distressing symptoms. So that's the physical. But then there's the psychological, the spiritual, and the cultural aspects. So this is really perceiving the person, the patient, as a whole person, not just based on their physical illness. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, kind of how this translates into real life examples. So one of my niche fields at uh, University of Chicago is I am attempting, so as I said, uh, palliative care and oncology are pretty much um, very well integrated with each other. I mean, there's still lots of work to be done, but it is uh, standard of care. And you know, still to date, the majority of patients our service sees is still probably oncology because we, we have the closest uh, connections with them. My own area of expertise is uh, cardiac palliative care, so I've started working uh, quite closely with both the cardiologists and the, um, the cardiac surgeons for over a wide variety of cases. So I just want to, um, as examples, put up two cases, and then I will talk about kind of shared decision-making uh, kind of um, models, and just kind of keep these cases in the back of your mind. We might not even have time to get back to them, but you know, for instance, these are very kind of representative kind of cases that I see. So case number one, a 68-year-old gentleman, history of stage four, which is the most advanced stage heart failure, uh, ejection fraction 25%. Those of you who know that is extremely reduced. Normal is about 60%. Numerous other medical issues, uncontrolled diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, current smoker, admitted for heart failure exacerbation. And this is usually a common cause of readmissions. You, you know, patients like these come back to the hospital you know, every other week, every month or so. Um, during admission, he is found to be in deep cardiogenic shock. Due to his medical comorbidities, he is not a candidate for what we call advanced options, like a heart transplant or an LVAD device, which is a supplemental device. Um, and so he's placed on very powerful IV medication called milrinone. Um, now, milrinone is a, as I said, very powerful. It's what's called an inotrope. It forces the heart to pump harder. It makes the patient feel subjectively better, but data sub says that it does not improve survival. If anything, it reduces survival. I often talk with my patients about medications like this. You know, they, they, sometimes they do have simple understanding. They're like, I feel better. I must, my heart must be getting better. And I kind of describe it as a whip. You can always whip a failing workhorse to get more work out of the horse, but ultimately that whip is going to stop working. And if anything, it might tire the horse out faster. And they sometimes get that analogy. And so we're consulted for initial assessment and goals of care, which I'll talk about that very amorphous uh, statement. So to contrast a little bit more kind of end of life uh, flavored case, case number two, a 60 year old lady is admitted after a massive myocardial infarction, um, massive heart attack in complete cardiopulmonary failure. So her heart doesn't work, her lungs don't work. Um, at an outside hospital, she's intubated, placed on you know, very powerful IV medications, and then transported to University of Chicago where she's placed on ECMO. That's uh, extracorporeal members oxygenation. It's about as extreme of an example of what lay people would call life support as you can imagine. Like your entire work of your heart and lungs is being done by a machine, your entire blood volume is is pumped out of a giant your, your vein in your groin, circulated in a machine, and pumped back into you. Um, so you know, it's, and I have to distinguish that from pediatric ECMO, where it actually is wonderful. Um, infants are very resilient; they actually come out of it, it. It's a great thing for them. But in an elderly patient, it is sometimes what we call a bridge to nowhere. So you know, palliative care is consulted as part of the ECMO protocol for family support and to assess goals of care. And this is a very new and exciting collaboration. Usually, you know, when palliative care is consulted for an ECMO patient, it's like they've been in the hospital for 40 days. You know, the, the doctors are like, we have nothing more to offer, and the, the patient's family don't get it. It's, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Rajkapal's example was where the doctors were the ones kind of forcing patients to remain on life support. The cases I'm called on, it's often the other way around, where the patient is on life support and the doctors, you know, they, 
they don't want to be like make a unilateral decision and say we're going to remove because it's not doing anything. But the families are often paralyzed with that decision. And so we're often consulted for that case. So um, I like to divide, you know, when we talk about goals of care, you know, it really is a catch-all term for like determining what the patient or the, and or the family wants. Um, you know, so it's shared decision making based on the values of the patient. And by patient, I mean the whole unit. So the patient as an individual in the center of kind of the circle, the family unit, the community unit, the, you know, you might include like church spiritual community, like a religious groups. You know, so, you know, and a patient is more than just the individual. And that's really Im something important that is often forgotten by uh, the medical field. Um, so, you know, as I said, we're often called to help facilitate discussions with the primary team regarding possible therapies in the setting of serious, uh, sometimes terminal states. So I like to divide it up into four critical questions. So, you know, this is probably, if you take anything out of my talk, these might actually be kind of valuable um, points. So the first, when I first meet a patient, is agenda setting. You know, getting to know the patient or the family if the patient is unresponsive, it's in, a, say, an ICU setting. You know, all the things bothering you, what do you want to talk about <coughs> at this time? You know, it's amazing. People look at me like, patients are like amazed. They're like, you're the doctor. I've never been asked this before. And I'm like, well, let's talk. What, what do you want? What's important to you? Advanced care planning. This has been referenced um, in terms of kind of like, we were talking, I think, yesterday about healthcare proxies and yeah. difficulty. But ask the patient, while, especially while they are earlier in their, hopefully, you know, we've been involved earlier where they are actually responsive. Who do you want to make your medical decisions for you? And then, you know, there's a separate question whether that person wants to be the <laughs> decision maker, but that is a separate uh, <coughs> debate. And this is the, these next two are really the meat of, I think, my field. I, I like to tell my uh, students that, like, the physical symptom management, that's actually pretty easy. There's, our armamentarian is not that extensive. It's the communication skills, learning how to talk to patients. That's the art of, uh, of our field. Priorities. As you think about your health and your life in the future, you know, in the context of your illness, you know, after you've talked to all these doctors who are saying that you, know, you are very sick, what is important to you? What is most important to you? And it's interesting, you, and you get a flavor of where the patient's mind is at. You know, some will say, like, you know, kind of go to the more, like, uh, spiritual, like, you know, I, I want to be at peace with God. Some will be like, oh, I have a patient, I have a granddaughter I want to see graduate. Others will be like, I want to be cured. And you're like, okay, I, I, I know the oncologist that said there's no cure, so we're going to have to work on this. But it gives you an insight into that patient's mind. And then finally, fears. This is so important, especially for people who are ill. What kinds of situations do you want to avoid regarding your health and health care. And let me, I'll go a little bit out of order and start with that. You know, I kind of, in the blue, I, I kind of updated some of, with some of the phrases I use. I love asking this question for the patients who are able to answer. Um, is there a quality of life which you would find unacceptable? You know, and the range of answers you get is astounding. I mean, so there are those who are like, you know, for me, life is an absolute good. I don't care, you know, how long it takes, how many machines you put me on, give me a life where every second, every second counts, regardless of quality. Others are like, I never want to be dependent on someone. You know, I freaking, I don't want to be in a nursing home with someone else wiping, you know, my bottom when I soil myself. These are very valid concerns and no one ever elicits them. And also importantly, going back to advanced care planning, have you discussed your wishes with the person you're designating? You know, it's, it's great to designate someone to make your decisions, but if you never talk to them about what you want, then that kind of nullifies the entire benefit of appointing someone as your proxy. You know, so it's like you, especially when we're, we get involved earlier in the course of disease, you know, I don't have to have all of these in-depth questions, very probing, personal questions all at once. You know, that's the point of starting palliative care involvement early in a disease course, like the first case, um, where 
the first meeting is kind of getting to know, ask some of the simpler questions, and then you can start planting the seeds <coughs> of like, well, you know, this is important to talk about with your loved ones. You know, have you thought of talking to them? They're like, oh, no, I'm too afraid. It's like, well, tell me more. That's also a very useful phrase, tell me more. It's, it's like kind of the mantra of uh, palliative care, that uh, many palliative care uh, instructors, you know, I and mean, it, it gives you so much from the patient. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, keeping these four critical questions in mind, so let's, hold on, okay, no. Um, go back to case number one. And so, you know, for instance, you know, how would I proceed with a case like this? So this is a patient ill, but not what we would call imminently dying. So, you know, while they might be appropriate for hospice, you know, I talk to them, and they're not ready for hospice mentally. You know, that's one of the issues with heart failure. It's like when you feel horrible, you feel horrible. But unlike cancer, where if you have progressive cancer that you're dying of, there is a point where hospitalizations kind of cease having any benefit. Heart failure, it's really hard. You, 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 are, you look like you're about to give up the ghost. You come back to the hospital, you get aggressively diabetes, and you feel great. Maybe a little less than a baseline, but you feel relatively better. So, you know, it's uh, more difficult with this patient population, but, you know, kind of talking to them about, like, so, you know, okay, hospice isn't what you want. Let's talk about your understanding of where you are. What have the other doctors told you? And I ask them to tell me, to, you know, to get a sense of where they're at. You know, and then a lot of times, you know, you kind of detect flaws in the communication with other healthcare providers based on that. Um, although, you know, as a caveat part, that could also be, you know, a poor understanding on the part of the patient. But you, one of the things we do is we, we really help bridge that gap in uh, understanding, a patient's understanding of their illness. How much time? Okay, okay perfect. Um, I mean, similarly with the ECMO protocol, it's, you know, these patients can be alive for like months, mm -hmm. sometimes in what, what my mentor calls a chronically unacceptable state. Um, and it really, and it's a horrible burden for many families to think about discontinuing <coughs> life-sustaining treatments. Even when they're aware that there's no, as I said, called it a bridge to nowhere, there is no end point. It's like you will just continue on until something goes wrong with the machine or you make the decision to stop the ECMO. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to be that, come in on day 42 and be like, hi, I'm the palliative care doctor, you've never met me. Um, I'm here to tell you that things aren't going very well. I don't know if the other doctors have told you that. Um, it's much better to meet them on day one. And you don't even ask those questions. You ask, you know, how are you, the, fa the family? You know, I, I, you know, what can we do to support you? Tell me about this person. What, was they, what were they like before they got sick? And that makes it easier on day you know, 10, 14, 20, however long it takes to start having some of the more in-depth discussions about, is this a quality of life your family member would find acceptable? When, I mean, based on who they were as a person. So I just want to leave you with kind of um, an interesting adage. I don't know who the attribution is, but it really encapsulates the complementary nature of palliative care. You know, it's adding life to one's years, not simply years to one's life. And with that, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for having me. There are five patients dying every minute because of unsafe care globally. So for World Patient Safety Day and um, for Dr. Raj Gopal here and for Dr. Charles, this poem. Before you examine the body of a patient, be patient to learn his story. For once you learn his story, you will also come to know his body. Before you diagnose any sickness, Make sure there is no sickness in the mind or the heart. For the emotions in the man's moon or sun can point to the sickness in any one of his other parts. Before you treat a man with a condition, know that not all cures can heal all people. For the chemistry that works on one patient may not work for the next. 
because even medicine has its own conditions. Before asserting a prognosis on any patient, always be objective and never subjective. For telling a man that he will win the treasure of life, but then later discovering that he's going to lose, will harm him more than by telling him that he may lose and finally he may win. This is the Maxims of Medicine by Susie Kasim. Fantastic. Basically, it just says be human first and a healthcare provider next. Oh, the, all of your presentations were wonderful. Uh, my question is directed to you, Charles. Um, the four critical questions that you shared, with the exception of the second one about appointing a, a proxy, uh, really sound like questions that a therapist would ask. Every one of them is perfect for uh, you know, addressing <coughs> issues of emotional import in your life. Um, so how much time, I have two questions, how much time in your practice is spent on talking and how much time is spent on medicine? And the second is, what do you do with the public perception that you may be the guy who wants to come in and turn off the machines? Well, really excellent questions. Um, <laughs> So the first question, I mean, the time is, um, it's variable. Um, it's, uh, so, you know, I do mainly inpatient consultations. So, you know, I have a bit more luxury. I'm not bound to a clinic schedule with, um, you know, I am bound by the number of patient consults I get. Um, but, you know, initial consultations, usually an hour or more sometimes. Uh, the actual medicine, as I said, our armamentarium of symptom uh, you know, alleviation is not that large, and it's rooted in kind of f basic medicine. Um, you know, we're a little bit more comfortable with like narcotics uh, and opioids, especially in the setting of like terminal pain. Um, but that's not that hard. You know, I, I, if someone's seriously constipated, I, I can make them poop. <laughs> you know, basically. Uh, so it really is talking with the patients. The second, um, the public perception of palliative medicine. So that has also been sh slowly changing over the last decade. Um, thanks n in no small part to many kind of champions um, outside our field. Uh, I know someone has already mentioned Atul Gawande's book, Being Moral. That was probably one of the like most prominent um, works out there that really introduced the concept of palliative care to the public, the general public. Um, and so it really is kind of educating them. So it's gotten to the point where um, my colleague who does a lot of outpatient palliative medicine in oncology, they'll be like, you know, a person shows up for their initial oncology visit and they're like, oh, so when can I see the palliative care doctor? It's like, oh, wow, that's, that's kind of opposite of what it used to be where like, you know, the oncologist is like, oh, you should see my colleague who's palliative care. It's like, why are you sending me to palliative care? Um, so it's changing. So it's about education. It's about exposure. Um, and um, just reaching the public with all this message.